These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Welcome to Africa World Nail Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, we present part one of a conversation we recently had with scholar organizer Prexy Nesbitt, as well as engage in a portion of a program that explores Samora Michelle and the Mozambican struggle for independence. This program includes significant contribution from Professor John S. Saul. In reflecting on the ideological tendencies and political predispositions of the black left in and around the anti-apartheid and African solidarity movement in the 1970s and 1980s, Prexy Nesbitt suggests that there were certain political moments and certain African liberation movements that highlighted the tendencies and orientations more than the normal ups and downs of African solidarity work. Three of those moments were one, the 1974 6 Pan-African Congress and decisions taken as to who would be invited and who would be allowed to participate in it. Two, Cuba's entry into the Angolan liberation struggle after the invitation extended to Cuba by Augusto Nito, the then president of the MPLA. And three, the overall performance and steady demise of the Pan-Africanist Congress throughout the 1970s and 1980s in direct proportion to the steady increase in support and relationship of U.S. activists and supporters to the African National Congress. Professor Nesbitt goes on to reflect on who or what shaped the ideological thinking and political orientations of black left activists and thinkers in the period of the 1970s and 1980s. Was it a solid and clear understanding of what was happening on the ground in the front lines of struggle, whether in Mozambique or Durban? Prexy Nesbitt suggested this was not the case. In fact, it was a clear lack of intimate knowledge of the situation that led to so much confusion about Angola and whether to support MPLA or UNITA. It was this very confusion that both Cabral and Rodney addressed as they engaged activists in their 1972 and 1975-76 visits. Prexy writes further, I don't think it was the profound intellectual debates and powerful analysis of the 1960s and early 1970s gathered together in collections like the African Liberation Reader or in the pages of the African Communists that molded the thinking of young American activists of the 1970s. Rather, it was meeting and listening to individual and penetrating charismatic individuals like Amakal Cabral, Samor Michel, Mwalimu, Julius Nerire, Fidel Castro, and Muhammad Babu, to name a few. It was classes and lectures from Walter Rodney, C.L.R. James, Maurice Bishop, and others that moved hundreds if not thousands of young Black, Asian, Latino, Indigenous American, Pacific Islander, and white folk to overt action and serious engagement, some for the rest of their lives. Few African American activists were lucky to live and work in places like Dar es Salaam, Lusaka, Algiers, and Cairo, sites that were in the middle of the struggle and provided intense education and political stimulation to all whom were in or around these spaces. Those who did spend time in places like Dar es Salaam got to benefit from meeting and getting acquainted with people like Eduardo Mondelein, Marcelino Dos Santos, Jorge Rebello, and the founder, president of the MPLA, Augusto Nito. Dar es Salaam was a heady milieu of struggle and liberation that shaped the thinking of many African Americans and others. Later, Dar es Salaam would be succeeded in its hosting role by Muputu, and people would benefit from encountering people like Ruth First, Joe Slovo, Alibi Sachs, and Paulo Jordan. Today, you will listen to part one of a conversation we recently had with Prexy Nesbitt, where we begin to construct a framework an activist intellectual biography, a point of entry into understanding the role of study and struggle, theory and practice, as a central pillar in black radical paraxis, a paraxis specifically rooted in a critical Africana human rights consciousness. Its purpose is to present, explore, map, and construct contemporary pathways into the constellation of ideas and practices that fundamentally resist a global world order that is rooted in race and racism, 
colonialism, imperialism, racial capitalism, through the people who were engaged in collective struggle. Exploring the ideas that for a time provided the hope that a better world could be realized. It is in these still burning embers that have traveled through time and across space to find relevance today that we intend to explore. To use as a framework too, as we always quote Thomas and Cover, invent the future. Born in Chicago, Illinois, Prexy Nesbitt was educated at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio with a degree in political science and a minor in 19th century Russian literature. He went on to attend the University of Dar es Salaam, Northwestern University, and Columbia University. His work includes direct and indirect activity in six Southern African liberation movements, the African National Congress, the ANC, Mozambique Liberation Front, Free Limo, Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, Zimbabwe African People's Union, ZAPU, the Zimbabwe African National Union, ZANU, the Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO, and the African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde, PAIGC. Returning to Chicago, he worked as a labor organizer and as a special aide to the then Chicago mayor, Harold Washington. He was later appointed consultant to represent the country and its interests in the United States, Canada, and Europe by the independent Mozambique government. He also engaged many formations that included, but not limited to, the Chicago Committee for the Liberation of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, American Committee on Africa, the Institute for Policy Studies, the African National Congress, Labors Against Apartheid, and Chicago Coalition for Illinois Divestment from South Africa. As an activist and educator, he has organized and taught throughout the United States and around the world. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities in Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Listen intently, think critically, act accordingly. Enjoy the program. We have the pleasure to be joined by Prexy Nesbitt today to engage in a very robust discussion, or basically an intellectual biography of Prexy in the context of liberation uh, movements and, and how he came to work in these particular spaces and the people that informed your political development. And I wanted to just take the time to just thank you, uh, Prexy, for joining us today. I'm very delighted. I'm very honored to be part of this. Thank you very much. And and again, you know, one of the things that we uh, like to do in the collective that we call Africa Well Now Project is really have robust organic discussions because what we're trying to do is to map activism, intellectual work. We're not separating theory from practice. We are looking at a clear understanding of how struggle informs uh, theory and theory informs struggle. Um, and with that being said, the center of the conversation that I want to have today, really want to kind of build a or construct a conversation around the role of the working class and anti-colonialist movements by looking at your experiences in these particular movements, but also building a intellectual biography of yourself. So with that being said, talk about Chicago in the context of informing your trajectory um, in your life. I came up in a very uh, stable, uh, middle-class Black family that was different from most middle-class Black families insofar as, A, they lived uh, collectively. They lived in a, all f there were five brothers who married professional African-American women, all of whom were very ta talented. Uh, they, the five brothers all went to the University of Illinois, and then they bought a building on the west side of Chicago in a neighborhood that was going from Jewish to black and owned that building collectively. It had about 10 apartments in it, and that's where I was raised, in that building. The schools in the west side of Chicago got very bad as the... Uh, one stable community changed, the Jewish people move, or white people 
evacuated, as one might say, and we, uh, this number of my parents and aunts and uncles were teachers. They saw how bad the schools were becoming in Chicago, put us, a number of us into private schools, particularly the Francis Parker School on the north side of Chicago, and we all went to school there. Um, after high school, then I went to a very alternative college, which was Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which sent more people to work in the civil rights movement than any other college its size in Mississippi in the mid 60s. I was in 65, 64, that period. Uh, my mother was adamantly opposed to my going south. She had been very much impressed by the killing of uh, Emmett Till, which had a great impact on all black people and all people in Chicago, uh, thinking people, that is. And uh, I ended up instead going to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania in 1965, the first foreign student that the new, newly established university of Dar es Salaam, University College of Dar es Salaam, had been set up in 60, 65. I joined that year, and uh, that was the beginning of my uh, spending time in Tanzania, which was the gateway to uh, the Southern African liberation movements, because they were all based at that point out of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, pretty much. Uh, I met large numbers of uh, Southern African liberation movement activists and fighters. My roommate at, at, at the University College of Dar es Salaam and constant companion was a man named Leifred Singe, who was a member of the African National Congress, the ANC. And that was the beginning, really. That was the beginning of my getting exposed. Now, I also had the advantage of the fact that my family's former pastor on the west side of Chicago had gone to become the pastor of refugees in Dar es Salaam. He was very close friends to a man who was the founder of the Mozambique Liberation Front, Eduardo Monlani. And I spent a lot of time with Eduardo even then. But jump forward a little bit uh, to, 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 to economize on this discussion. And in 1968, after being put out of the Columbia University in the big famous protest of that year, I was about to be drafted and left the country and tried to go and join the Mozambique Liberation Front to fight. Uh, Eduardo said to me very astutely, how is your Makua, how is your Makonde? Are you ready to communicate with peasants inside the countryside in Mozambique who are the, 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 the source of our movement? I said, no, I don't, you, you know I don't speak. He said, well, the, well you, have to, you can't fight arms and hand with us. But you can do other things, which are just as important. You can help us build a school system. And there was a thing in Dar es Salaam called the Mozambique Institute. And that's where I started working, at the Mozambique Institute in 1968, in the fall of 68, and helping to build the school system. Um, Eduardo was assassinated in February of 69. And I had to return shortly thereafter to the United States uh, because my mother was dying of cancer. And I got back to the United States uh, and started working once again on behalf of liberation movements. And at this point, I worked for the American Committee on Africa organizing anti-apartheid uh, movements. And that went on until again uh, in 79. Uh, that went on from 77 to 79. 79, I started working for the World Council of Churches 
program to combat racism, doing a lot of work with the liberation movements. And then in the 80s, the late 80s, uh, about the same, I started working for Harold Washington, and then the Mozambican government asked me, by this time it was an independent free country, uh, they asked me to work as a, a, a lobbyist and organizer for them in the United States. And I did that for the next four years, working all over the country, building a Mozambique support network. This is a good stopping point. I'm glad we're we're taking a pause because you said a number of things there that I want to come back to. Sure. Um, but I also don't want us to miss the fact that you do have a background in core. You have a background. You come from a union uh, background, but also a Garvey background. Could you talk a little bit more about the influences of those particular uh, associations as you're moving into uh, this more more internationalist work? And you mentioned uh, going to school uh, in Tanzania. Could you talk a little bit of how you how that happened? Because I, I've I've heard um, in another conversation that you were having a few years ago that. You know, SNCC Freedom Summer, of course, a lot of your friends, a lot of people you know and comrades and colleagues were able to go there, but you went to Africa. Before you get there, let's talk about, you know, the union background, but also, you know, the influences of, you know, a Garvey. Well, I think that the Garveyism influence is a very interesting one because it comes through my father and his brothers, through these Nesbitt brothers who all were raised in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and all of whom read regularly all the Garvey publications. And I had two uncles that I really didn't know them. I, I saw them as children, as a child rather, and they were members of UNIA and read the UNIA publications regularly. My father, I can't count the number of times my father and uncles would say to me, if only your uncle Rob or your uncle Rufus had known that you went to Africa and studied there, they would have been so proud. But they they died before I did that. But my father and my uncles delivered UNIA materials and papers in Champaign, Illinois, uh, where they grew up. So there was a marked influence of, of Garvey and the UNIA movement on them, which made a marked influence on me. So there was never any period in my life that Africa was rejected. Africa was totally embraced all my life. And uh, the, the work done by Paul Robeson also the work done by any of the great leaders we had who embraced Africa, we embraced it too. So I went, I went and heard Robeson speak on the ha on behalf of the African uh, uh, organization that he had started. I didn't ever get to hear Marcus Garvey, but I read speeches and read the newspaper, and then followed avidly what the uh, Muhammad Speaks newspaper, which was one for a long time, the really the only regular source uh, after the, the decline of the Garvey papers uh, that gave you news about Africa. Although the Defender tried to do a job and we knew the people doing the Defender. So I would say that yes, that was a very important ongoing influence. Uh, the other in Chicago, there was a man, a man by the name of, uh, he was with the Urban League, I'll have to think of his name, who was absolutely delighted that I decided to go and study in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Now, there's an interesting th story there. I wanted to go to Africa, and where I wanted to go was Rhodesia. And through the Antioch College Study Abroad program, because my mother had said adamantly, I will not let you go to Mississippi. Every white boy down there at Antioch College can go. I ain't going to let you go. So she said, I will pay 
for you to go to Africa. So I researched it and found that one of the places that was doing a lot of freedom work was in Rhodesia. And I applied and was accepted and was ready to go to study at the University College of Rhodesia. Two weeks before I was supposed to leave, a telegram arrives from the Rhodesian government. You are not allowed to go. We are rejecting your application. And so that was out. There was a guy who was a Quaker at Antioch College who knew that they had started a new university. He said, try there. And sure enough, I got accepted to go. And I'm sure I was the first African-American. But in fact, I think I was the first American foreign student. There was a the daughter of another Quaker, the American Friends Service Committee, had an outpost there. And a very famous man, Bill Sutherland, worked with that American Friends Service Committee in Dar es Salaam. He, that daughter, she was there, but she wasn't really an enrolled student. She just attended some classes. White woman, I can't remember her name. But the first foreign student was me. There's no doubt about that. So this, the, the union, um, you know, labor uh, yes. oh, becomes yeah. very me, important. Yeah, yeah. Go back to that. Yeah. Because my father and my uncle were, well, my father and my uncle, my uncle had become a lawyer at the University of Illinois. And he did so much defense of people as he finished law school at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana that the the sheriff of Champaign County said, we'll either take you out of here in a coffin or string you up because he was defending all of the workers who were working at a, uh, a student union building that was just being integrated. At any rate, he finishes law school. My father finishes engineering school, although the as he was given his engineering degree the head of the engineering school the electrical engineering school said i hope your best never gets a job anywhere in this country that's what he whispered to him as he was given the degree they move up to chicago as many people moved up to chicago in that period they became very active organizing red caps baggage porters who were the equivalent to there, they're called sky caps. But in those days, it was the railroads and the bus station. So they started organizing unions at both the Trailways bus station in Chicago and at the Dearborn Street station, which had the trains going south and trains going west. Uh, and this is an incredible uh chapter of my development because years later i would work with red caps myself trying to earn money to go to keep going to antioch who worked with my uncle worked with my uncle and knew him to have been one of the founders of the black red caps union the there was a white red caps union too but at that point, when my uncle was working, the, the two didn't work together. Um, that was the beginning of my own union stuff. But my mother and father and all Nesbits were very active in any union. There was never any sentiment that we didn't get involved in a union. And you mentioned, you know, Rhodesia, of course, I mean, it follows logic that you would you would be rejected <laughs> from Rhodesia, uh, studying in Rhodesia. I would I would say, I mean, because, you know, of course, we know Rhodesia was named after Cecil Rhodes. Right. You know, exactly. you know, so so, uh, you know, your your response to that was to and, and and what's interesting how history works and how things do not work. Like history doesn't work in a linear fashion. There's all of these particular things that move us. And so, of course, this takes you to Dar Salaam, which I want to take because that's a very important period in your life in the context of coming into contact with a lot of young folk who are also participating in anti-colonialist movements. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Modulani, 
um, um, you know, there obviously there is some more, you know, some more Rochelle. You mentioned uh, Bill Southern Sutherland as well, and I want to I want to put a pin in that because, of course, Bill Sutherland is also uh, responsible for Malcolm bringing Malcolm X, which one of his last uh, uh, visits to the African continent uh, was coming to Dar es Salaam. And Bill Sutherland was involved with that, am I, if I'm not mistaken, on, on that as well. Absolutely, very involved in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's put a pin in that because, of course, I'm talking to you on the uh, on the day of remembrance of of, of Malcolm's, Malcolm. uh, you know, assassination. Right. Uh, <laughs> there's so many ways that I could take that um, mm-hmm. that that thrust that that remembrance mm-hmm. because yes, indeed. Uh, Dar es Salaam was the the hate the center of the Southern African liberation movements, and it, when I go to university there, I go to school uh, and study with uh, scholars, many of whom had been thrown out of Rhodesia and South Africa, and I start studying under them. I, I think particularly of a British guy named uh, Terence Ranger, who was one of the foremost scholars about Rhodesia, what will become Zimbabwe. He So studying with him, I learned tremendous amounts about ZANU and ZAPU. So I'm, I'm, I'm around Mozambicans. I'm learning about ZANU and ZAPU. One of my best friends is an ANC member so then a lot, there, there are many people from, from Namibia there. So one day I get an invitation to go and the Namibian students hearing that about this African-American guy up at the university, they invite me to come and speak about Malcolm X. And so I agree to do it. And I get there and within 15, 20 minutes of talking with him, I realize they know much more about Malcolm and El Haj Malik Shabazz than I do. And then what I can do is simply affirm many of the things they have already read about and kept up with. So that was a real eye opener to me about, uh, see, these were people from Namibia, Southwest Africa. I didn't know that much about Southwest Africa. Although I would later do a major paper as I finished Antioch, my undergraduate degree, about the World Court of Justice and Southwest Africa or Namibia. Um, but that was that was the it, the atmosphere of of Dar es Salaam at that time. Now, when I go back to work uh, after I've been thrown out of Colombia, and I'm on the run from the Vietnam War because I was one of the people very impacted by uh, Muhammad Ali saying, I ain't going to fight the Vietnamese. None of them ever called me the N-word. Uh, I've found with my students, when I mean, you can't say the, the term, they go crazy and show they're really political by jumping on you if you do that. I was uh, very impacted by that whole period, I'd say, very impacted. And all of the liberation movements there in Tanzania in that period were very conscious. And over that period and over the, especially the next phase that I'm in Dar es Salaam, when I'm working for Frilimo in 68, 69, more African-Americans Begun, begin to come to Dar es Salaam. And there's uh, some very historic figures. Robert Williams is one of them. Um, I have to say to you that there was a lot of uh, difficulties. There was not just smoothness in the integrating of African-American struggles and people with Southern African struggles and people. Um, there were very vicious uh, agents. The book Africa Liberation Movement by a man named uh, Gibson. I've been just writing about that. I did a review of that book 
he turns out to be a straight up CIA agent working uh, to subvert all the African Americans coming to Dar es Salaam. The suspicions of African Americans get so great at one point that they bureaucrats in the Tanzanian government think that the African Americans sending arms to Tanzania, that was a big mistake, that they were getting ready to try to overthrow the Nereri government. And so they in turn they detained all the African Americans in Tanzania at one point. Now, I was very fortunate in all this because I was firmly rooted in Frilimo. I was I was uh, I did everything but know very well a different Mozambican languages, but I was I was I was doing work and very close to all the leaders. To this day, I still have a tremendous uh, closeness to all the Mozambican particularly leaders and through them, I get to meet many others. For instance, uh, in the period of 69, as I mentioned, Eduardo Monlani gets assassinated. Uh, a person who came to the funeral uh, was none other than Amilcar Cabral. And that's when I first meet the great leader of PAIGC, Amilcar Cabral. In that same period before Eduardo died, uh, a person that came into Tanzania that many of your audience may know is uh, Che Guevara. And I remember my university professor saying to me, Prexi, I was up studying at the university. This is in the 65, 66 period. And there was an adult education institute called the Patrice Lumumba Institute in downtown Dar es Salaam. And she taught a course there, British woman, wonderful woman, very progressive. She says to me, Prexy, I'm having a guest come. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I want you to come with me to my class at the Patrice Lumumba Adult Education Institute. And I get there, and there are two people doing a press conference. One I knew very well, that was Eduardo Monlani. The other person was Che Guevara. And Che Guevara had come to Dar es Salaam as part of his coming to Africa to provide Cuban assistance to the liberation struggles. His assistance was rejected by the Mozambicans. They said to him, we, we respect you, we admire the Cuban struggle, but we Mozambicans will do the struggle here in Mozambique. And so there were great discussions. There was exchange of other materials, but Cuban forces never fought in the Mozambican theater. Where they did become critical was, of course, in the Angolan struggle. And I learned a great deal about all of that later in another phase. So let's, let's, there's a lot there. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let, let's also, um, it's it's important for me to highlight. I mean, you mentioned Colombia. You mentioned sixty eight. It's a, it's important to highlight the fact that there's an institutional and non institutional uh, process of being, you know, educated, right, um, in movement, but also an uh, in the non institutional process of being in Dar es Salaam. But also, you went to Antioch. You were in Colombia in sixty eight. And let's be clear. Uh, the protest that you are talking about is the protest for Black studies, right? This is the same right. particular period. They talk a little bit about those connections, the the processes of of history of moving you through these particular realms, and you're picking up all of these um, uh, ways of understanding the world and putting them together to inform your own worldview. Let me talk a little bit about Colombia. Uh, when I started graduate school at Columbia, I just have written about this, so it's very mm. timely. When I started graduate school at Columbia, I was a political science major. I had a fellowship as a graduate student. And <laughs> the first thing I noticed was this is not Antioch any longer. And I was with these very reactionary racist professors that I just totally disagreed with, except for one or two. 
one exception was a wonderful woman named Marcia Wright, who was a white woman, but she knew East African history and was sympathetic. She was not like uh, other people who were at Columbia. Uh, I'd have to get back in my notes to get it. There was a guy, for example, who was at Columbia named Karras, Tom Karras. There was another guy who was there. I can't remember his name. I can get it for you later. That guy tried to recruit me into the CIA because there were all these direct ugh, direct linkages between Columbia and and the U.S. government. When we did, I when we got involved in the protest, which was a protest that white students and black students. I'm not going to discuss the who did first which, and that's a big uh, historical point of debate, whether the black students preceded the white students in occupying Colombia or the, or, or the white students preceded the black students. And they didn't, they didn't continue working together. And so the black students all occupied Hamilton Hall, and I was one of the three or four graduate students was there uh, when I was thrown out? When we were all thrown out, uh, I lost my fellowship and was immediately drafted to go to the Vietnam War, which, as I said earlier, I wouldn't would not do. Um, but while we were in Colombia, we had some interesting discussions, and one of them was the white students were thrown out of Hamilton Hall by the black students, told they weren't revolutionary enough. And they went on and occupied six or three or four other buildings at, at Columbia University. The black students stayed in Hamilton Hall. One of the demand, the demands of the white students was in not only the ending the Vietnam War, but also getting out of Harlem. And Columbia was taking over properties and buildings, expanding into Harlem. That was the main protest point of the black students and their occupation. I and maybe one or two others argued that we should also be protesting the Columbia ties to the Vietnam War. But we, I was, <laughs> I remember intense debates where I was by myself arguing that position in 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 our group in Hamilton Hall. Um, another Africa related thing was that as we we happened to be in a office center where there was a man named Wallerstein who was had his office in there. And I remember that some of my, the young undergraduates uh, got in his office while we were occupying that building and were it, it sort of trashing his stuff. And I had a long discussion with them and told them, look, I know this man. I know his work. The work he has done is very, very sensual work. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't do anything to this stuff. This is, isn't an ally. And I luckily was able to convince them of that. But it was the beginning of a very interesting way that I began to take a more uh, progressive, more radical stance than just a, a African, a, a sort of black hate of white people stance. I began to take a much more progressive political position. And I worked with a group who include Bill Epton and uh, Sam Anderson, famous names who were all in Harlem. And I think my presence there also helped to cement the ties between community activists in Harlem and the black students, uh, especially the undergraduates who were occupying uh, Columbia. And as you know, that became a big, big demonstration. It was not a a little tiny, it went on for two or three weeks and all of New York was watching the occupation of Columbia University. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we can put a pin, we can put a pin in our conversation because, you know, there's like, I got like three pages of things to kind of, kind of pick back up. Uh, but yeah. let's go ahead. We can put a, I know you have to go, but we can put a pin in a, in a conversation. And when we pick back up, uh, we'll, we'll pick back up with your time specifically in Dar Salaam and, uh, you know, Bill Sutherland, um, and also, uh, Walter, uh, Bogoya, uh, some more Michelle. And we will give yes. a, an ANC as well, your entry yeah. point into the ANC. With that being yeah. said, we'll put a pause in it and we'll set up another time. Samora Michelle was born the son of a peasant farmer on September 29, 1933, in Gaza province of southern Mozambique. At the age of 31, he was one of 250 freedom fighters who launched an armed struggle against the Portuguese colonial regime. For more than 10 years, he commanded the revolutionary forces of Frelimo, the front for the liberation of Mozambique. With Frelimo's victory in 1975, he became his country's first president. On the night of October 19, 1986, Samora died, along with 33 of his delegation, when his presidential plane, returning from a summit in Zambia, crashed into a hillside in the eastern Transvaal region of South Africa. John Saul, professor of political science at York University in Toronto, was a personal friend of Samora Michel. He has lived and worked in Mozambique and taught at the Frelimo Party School in Maputo. So dramatic in, in, in his interaction with people. I don't think anyone who ever attended a meeting at which he was at or even a room in which he entered could help but feel that electricity that he carried with him. And it's hard not to sound cliched about it, but there it was. I mean, I've never myself been exposed to anyone who gave you that kind of electric shock when they, uh, of personality when, 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 when they entered into a, into a situation. And so I think those who came in contact with him in any way had that feeling that they're, in some way their own horizons were, were expanded by the energy that he communicated uh, to them. But I think a lot of it had to do as well with his ability to learn uh, from, from the struggle and, be, and, and to develop positions that, that made sense and, and communicated messages that in Southern Africa were very important to communicate. When we last met with Samora Michel in Maputo in 1984, his country was suffering from a wide infiltration of Renamo bandits, the so-called Mozambican National Resistance. Seja claro. Seja claro. Vai diretamente ao problema. Diga ela. Be, be clear. Diga so claramente. To your problem. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think what people, for instance, say about a country like Zimbabwe, that Zimbabwe has not transformed too quickly. But Mozambique transformed very quickly. That's why the enemy you know, has pounced on Mozambique the way it has done. Hoping to end the bloody struggle with Renamo and continue his country's development, Samora Michel had signed the Incomati Peace Accord with South Africa, in which the South Africans had promised to stop supporting Renamo. It now seems that the South Africans never intended to keep their promise. Colonialism é um crime contra a humanidade. Colonialism is a crime against humanity. There is no humane colonialism. There is no democratic colonialism. There is no non-exploitive colonialism. In that area of Gaza where he grew up, uh, he had a living memory, in effect, of, of resistance to the Portuguese because Portuguese penetration in that area had been relatively late. But also, in even closer to his own birth and during the time of his youth, it was a period when the Portuguese were still taking land from his family and other families in the area. So he had that very strong sense of Portuguese despoilation uh, in, 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 his very, in his very youth. Uh, and subsequent to that, he 
train, but with difficulty, because the Portuguese were not about to offer very much education to, to Africans in that, in that colonial setting. But he managed to train as a male nurse and came to work in, in hospitals in southern Mozambique and in Yak Island and ultimately in Maputo. And again, I think from that perspective, he got some strong sense of what it felt like to be uh, un the underdog within a society controlled by a white colonial uh, regime. Uns ficam sente e orgulhosos porque foram colonizados pelos ingleses. Os ingleses são civilizados, se constituem um grande império. There are some who feel a certain pride because they were colonized by the English. The English are civilized and had built a great empire. E outros, porque foram colonizados pelos franceses e pensam que intelectualmente são mais desenvolvidos, mais civilizados, mais evoluídos, porque foram colonizados pelos franceses. There are others who think because they were colonized by the French, they are more intellectually developed, more civilized, more evolved, because they were colonized by the French. Eu fui colonizado pelos portugueses. I was colonized by the Portuguese. País mais subdesenvolvido da Europa. The most backward country in Europe. <laughs> but still colonialist. That force, that drive, I think, which was which was most remarkable and which uh, carried him to the to the very center of of nationalist politics. At a certain point, of course, as Ferlimo was taking shape, he he among others learned of this in Mozambique and was amongst the first to to leave Mozambique uh, to to join up with the new Ferlimo movement in 1962 and in a very early stage as well got involved in the military side of the struggle and rose through the ranks militarily. Here they come. Here comes Ferlimo. Here comes Ferlimo. So many of them tall and strong. And look at the colonialists, impotent with their horns. You can see it in very clear ways that began to distinguish Mozambican nationalism from nationalisms elsewhere in Africa who hadn't had the necessity to come up against a colonial power of quite the Portuguese kind, one that was not giving in to the initial demands of nationalism but was digging in its heels and had to be struggled against in a much deeper and more fundamental way. Uh, and there were people in Ferlimo who weren't going to make that move. And in fact, there were struggles within Ferlimo between Samora Michel and his colleagues and others who wanted a much more conventional, easy passage towards independence that they had seen certain other African countries in the end uh, experience. But the Portuguese weren't going to give them that kind of an easy passage and therefore uh, all the more reason why Samora and his colleagues emerged to the fore. But they did it by asking critical questions. They asked critical questions about what was necessary to win uh, a struggle against the Portuguese, and that wasn't going to be done by mere militarism. It had to be done by deepening your links to a popular base. A luta the struggle continua. continues. A luta continua. A luta continua. Contra o quê? Against what? Against what must the struggle continue? Contra o tribalismo. Against tribalism. A luta continua! Samora Michel's writings during the period of the struggle, they turn around questions of what would production look like that actually service the people? What would uh, gender relations look like that began to move towards equality? What kind of health and education services do we need in the liberated areas, but also subsequently in a, in a, in a truly liberated Mozambique that would service people's interests rather than the interests of a, of a, of a new kind of leadership that might merely be black skins uh, for whites? 
And what else must we struggle against? Ignorancia. Against ignorance. Contra o analfabetismo. Against illiteracy. Contra a exploração do homem pelo homem. Against exploitation. Contra superstição. Against superstition. Contra a miséria. Against misery. Contra a fome. Against Contra hunger. Contra o pé descalço. Against lack of clothing. A luta continua. The struggle continues. Para que sejamos todos homens iguais. So that someday we will all be equal. In Maputo, Gaza, Inyamban, in Baira, Manika, Sofala. Long live Frelimo in all of our land. Comrade President, when Frelimo looks back to the past, would you say the political leadership acted too quickly in transforming the country into a Marxist-Leninist state? This question is very interesting. It is Western, the Western point of view. They think that in Mozambique, we've had natural disasters and other things because we've moved ahead too quickly. Those who cannot read or write accept this theory. I'd like to answer that question, no. It was neither too soon nor too late. We acted at the opportune time with force and firm conviction. We decided what our revolution would be. We took back the land soon after declaring independence. You think that was too quick, taking back the land? It was held for 500 years in the hands of a few. 500 years. We took it back after 10 years of war. We were victorious and we said, we will now give the land back to the people. Was that too quick? We nationalized schools and hospitals that were serving a minority. They were instruments of privilege. Do you think that was too soon? The colonialists exploited us and stole our land. But now we are independent. We live by working with hand and hope. Ian Smith had made slaves of so many Zimbabweans. He killed so many patriots with the complicity of the West. When we took power in less than a year, in six months, we applied total sanctions against his government. Do you think we were adventurers? Do you think we were being irresponsible? Zimbabwe is there a fact. Here our power is consolidated, indomitable, because it's defended by the people. The people don't defend abstractions. They defend concrete things. The land is a concrete thing. A dwelling, a school, a hospital is a concrete thing. The struggle, the enemy, is concrete too. For these reasons today, our people are standing up to the armed bandits and are certain of victory. Por causa desses resultados todos, da nossa luta, nós não nacionalizamos a indústria. We didn't nationalize industry. We didn't nationalize business. A indústria e o comércio. Industry and business were abandoned, and there were no Mozambicans capable of taking over. E comerciantes, nenhum estava. No one knew the legal channels. The patterns of commerce, the business of importing and exporting. Those who knew ran away precisely so our government would fail. Who is Renamo and why, why are they there? Why are there bandits so widely infiltrated into Mozambique? 
Well, if you look back at the very outset of, of Renama, where it came from, it's, it's apparent that it was invented, in effect, by the uh, Rhodesians in the first instance in, in the late 70s, when it was clear that Mozambique, an independent Mozambique, was going to be a, a, a place where ZANU, the liberation movement in, in, in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia as it then was, was going to be operating from. The a preemptive strike was seen to be the order of the day by people in the Central Intelligence Organization in, in Rhodesia. So what they did was recruit in conjunction with some Portuguese uh, financiers and the like who had had a large stake in Mozambique and were anxious to undermine Ferlimo's uh, project. Uh, what they did was recruit from the old Portuguese structures, the police and the commandos and the flushes, uh, some of the most uh, horrific elements of, of Portuguese, including some Africans. Hey there, you, shattered in a thousand pieces, weeping in the darkest night. That's it for Africa Woke Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. Follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. Instagram at Africa Woke Now Project. Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa Woke Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Moisa Muntali. Africa World Now Project Media Correspondent, Funa Ngonda. Senior Research Content Contributor and Production Director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui. Senior Research Content Contributor and Production Associate, Dr. Josh Myers. Associate Producer and Content Contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry. Content Contributor and Filmmaker, Kurt Waterson. Technology Advisor, it's Byron Gray of Greyworks Technologies. And Creative Directors, International Creative and Artist Designer, Tabasam Siddiqui and Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. Feeling, buried under deeper ground. Go out, it's a waiting game. Hey, the whole never gonna see.